Gary, thanks for for taking some time to talk with me today. Um, I think my first question for you is thinking about your role as a business historian. So can you describe a little bit of what kind of work does a business historian do and how do you communicate that work? Oh, yeah. Well, that's an interesting question. I don't think I've really been asked it quite that uh, directly before. Uh, You know, I labeled myself a business historian uh, because I've been interested in it all my life. Uh, I don't have a, a graduate degree. Uh, in anything, you know, sometimes you might assume anybody that runs a giant company is smart, but we know from Enron and Drexel Burnham, and we could go on and on the list, Sears Roebuck in the last 30 years, um, that they aren't always smart. The heads of Enron and the CEO ended up dying in jail, you know, he yeah. didn't really understand business, even though he had a, 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 a the, all those leaders at Enron had MBAs from Harvard and Stanford and all these uh, theoretically fine or, or in reality fine business schools, uh, but somehow they didn't understand business. And uh, the whole thing was kind of driving me nuts. Nobody really wanted to talk about these these big companies. And, uh, and GM was really the only one that I knew very well, uh, that and household products. I remember riding away to Procter & Gamble to ask him about their history when I was looking at the horse and dog magazines. My big brother's looking at the automobile and uh, airplane magazines and stuff. And I discovered Fortune Magazine, the great American business magazine. And the issue was just out. They Every year they do a list of the 500 biggest U.S. companies. And I open it up and their General Motors was the biggest, really the best run company on earth at that time. And, uh, and, the, and not only did the writers in that uh, magazine try to ask the same questions I was asking, try to answer them, uh, find the answers, they also, um, there were 499 other companies listed, most of which I'd never heard of. And I went and run and my parents said, man, you got to get me subscriptions magazines. Coolest thing I've ever seen. And they're like, oh, you weird kid. You know, why don't you go play basketball like a normal Indiana kid? Anyway, I did play a little basketball on the on the driveway. <laughs> uh, everybody did. Uh, but um Anyway, I got my subscription to Fortune, and two months later, I entered the seventh grade. <laughs> so I started subscribing <laughs> to Fortune when I was 12. Well, I'll be 70 probably by the time this is broadcast uh, here <laughs> shortly. And so I think that's 58 years of reading Fortune magazine. And, and then I read the history of General Motors. A book came out that same year. Bill Gates once called it, uh, if you're only going to read one book about business, he said, this is the book to read. It's called My Years with General Motors by Alfred P. Sloan, who was a management genius who built General Motors and really created the management model that most of the companies around the world uh, still use today. Um, and so by 13 or 14, I was a business historian. <laughs> and then I fell in love with retailing after that and started reading everything I'd get my hands on. And um, they... Uh, uh, now I live in a house with 57,000 books. Um, I'm guessing about 40% of them are about business history. Uh, I bought an old commercial building. It was a, an abandoned, uh, vacant community health clinic. So I had like 34 little exam rooms. So each room is a different subject. So one room is just retailing. One room is just airlines. Two rooms are automobile industry history. I still love that one. Um, one room is just media history, movies, uh, music, uh, newspapers, television, radio, all that. Uh, one room is uh, general business history. It's a huge room. Uh, I collect financial reference books going back in time. And, and as I've studied it all my life, now I obviously was doing some other things, started like nine companies, if you include the three little ones in college, and Hoover's, which was a big business information site and went public and sold to Dun & Bradstreet, uh, some of your viewers, listen, uh, listeners will, will know the uh, Dun & Bradstreet Hoover service. Um, mm-hmm. All the time I kept, I, well, studying business of all types. I started out with big companies, but then became an entrepreneur and then uh, teach entrepreneurship and wrote books about it and all that jazz. And um, so I studied every industry, I think every industry, that's safe to say by now, and uh, companies from little tiny ones, startups, zero employees, you know, to uh, the giants of the world. Um, And as I did all that, there's so much to be learned from the history. Uh, People make the same mistakes that were made before. In fact, to be frank, I don't read Fortune every issue anymore because I found the stories are the same ones I read 30 years ago. They just have different actors. It's like seeing a play with a new cast, you know, or a remake of a movie, mm-hmm. King Kong over and over. Well, you know, I know how this story turns out or, you know, I've read this story before and there's just so much to be learned. And yet 
if you if you Google any subject, some rare type of bird or dog or uh, uh, you know how to knit or weave or quilt or you know railroads, there's uh, probably thousands of websites about railroads and railroad history. Any subject you look at, there's one, two, three, or a thousand websites about it. But if you Google business history, nothing, nothing. I mean, you'll say, oh, there was a seminar at Harvard about it, or here's one book about it, but no real nexus or place where all the information comes together. And to the extent that there are, I mean, business history has been left behind in the academic world. Uh, there's last I looked, there's only one MBA program in the world that requires business history, and it's in Denmark. It requires you to take a, a course in it to get your MBA. But then they don't even offer business a business history course at the University of Chicago Business School, one of the greats at the University of Texas Business School, where I was the entrepreneur in residence. There hasn't been a decent uh, like a college level textbook in business history uh, published since about 1990. Harvard is the one place where it stands out. They have something like 20 some professors. Wharton does some good stuff in it. You'll find the professor here and there, but even then most of them are focused like many academics are on just appealing to their peers, you know, getting in the journals and getting reviewed and all that. And that's all fine. I read all that stuff. I collect the, the big business history journal Harvard publishes, uh, big, I don't, I don't know how many readers it has. Um, but they they rarely try to reach out to the general public. And, and you know, that's a long tradition in academia. Milton Friedman, my old teacher, you know, he took a lot of flack when he started writing a column in Newsweek. And then with Bob Chittister, uh, uh, created Free to Choose, a uh, documentary the series for PBS, which was a huge hit. But a lot of economists said, well, no, you shouldn't be doing that. You know, that's, you know, talking to the public, you know. So... Uh, from all that, uh, two years ago, um, the spring of 2019, yeah, um, friends and I created a website, AmericanBusinessHistory.org, a 501c3 and a website. We just launched a national student essay contest, the best high school essay, where they go and write up the history of a local business in like a one to oh. 2,000 word essay, a $3,000 first prize and $1,000 second prize and so on. Uh, so... And, and we're growing right now. I just checked the numbers about an hour. We're, we're up something like eight times as many people visiting our website as was true a year ago. Uh, it took a while for Google search to begin to find some of our articles. But we have well over 100 articles. We publish a free weekly newsletter. And the idea is just to get people engaged with business history to, to see how fascinating and interesting it is. Uh, a lot of our early readers are investment types. Um, we get a lot of people are in the nostalgia, a lot of former employees, like when I write something about IBM, get all these emails. Oh, I worked for IBM for a year or <laughs> 20 years or 50 years. And, and it was great or it was awful or whatever. I wrote a thing about Federal Express, Fred Smith, who I consider the um, greatest active living entrepreneur. And that surprises students in the classroom because they're always looking for Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk. But Fred Smith is still running his company and he's uh, around 70 years old. And, uh, and he dreamed it up and started it. And it's the world's largest airline in revenue and the world's largest airline in uh, big, most valuable uh, market capitalization. So it's an accomplishment. Um, but there is so much to be learned. It's fun, interesting stuff. I even wrote one called Who Makes Our Balls? And I went through who makes the footballs used by the NFL, the basketballs used by the NBA, uh, uh, NBA and the uh, baseballs used by Major League Baseball. And I think I may have touched on like soccer and stuff as well. Hockey, maybe. But, you know, it turns out, well, one's made by Warren Buffett's company and one's made by a Finnish company or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, they're old names that people remember Rawlings and Spalding and all this. Wilson, a big one, which was a meatpacking company that didn't know what to do with the excess pigskins or whatever. So they made oh. footballs. Huh. And, oh, the stories are great, but they're also management lessons. I write these biographies, yeah. the wonderful Archbridge Institute. Uh, publishes these uh, longer biographies I, uh, I write, uh, a friend writes some of them too, uh, and my buddy Dave Stanwick, and we've done, I want to say 25 of them. Yeah, uh, quite a few. So that's the American oh, yeah. Original Series, and I'll, I'll make sure to yes. add that in the notes for this show, as well as the American Business History Center. Uh, one thing you said that Great. jumped out to me a bit here is that, um, you know, you were reading some of these Fortune magazine pieces, and you're 
you're saying, wow, this is kind of the same story, but with new characters and new cast. So clearly there's a pattern, you know, to some of these things. So, and if there is a pattern that, that means that at least from your perspective, you can kind of aggregate and pull out some of the big lessons from these. So, and you mentioned, you know, Fred Smith is one of the greatest living entrepreneurs. So I guess what, what made him such a successful, great entrepreneur and, and sort of what lessons uh, do you find most common? What what patterns do you think are most common in these stories? Yeah, yes, and th- there are lots and lots of patterns. And uh, one in the other direction, uh, before I come back to Fred and, and the greatness, um, are the failures. Because mm-hmm. as a retail lover, I've studied the decline of Sears and Kmart, which I, I was a stock analyst on Wall Street covering the retail companies back in the 70s. And they get arrogant. It goes to their head. Hubris, you know, they call it. And uh, they become so caught up in their own internal, uh, they even have their own internal language and all their procedures. They uh, stop worrying about the competitors. Uh, they get the not invented here syndrome. Uh, most important of all, they stop listening to their customers. Um, and, we, and tied into all that are the executive egos. You see so many big acquisitions. Um, they call them uh, transformative or transforming deals. We're going to buy this company and therefore remake our company that's doing the buying. And I think most studies show something like, I think it could be as high as 80%, definitely over 50% of all acquisitions and big mergers don't turn out the way they expected them to, that they, uh, they don't do as well as people thought. A uh, classic case would be uh, AOL Time Warner where technically AOL, because it was a hot company, bought Time Warner, but the people that ran Time Warner ended up running the whole thing. And, you know, it was a disaster. Even uh, Daimler uh, Benz, the great automobile and truck and bus maker, people don't realize how how big their truck and bus business is worldwide. Um, They bought Chrysler. And I, in my first book, I wrote how I thought that would be a good one that would work because it really balanced in a lot of ways. It added a extra a product lines, including Jeep, which has been very successful. Um, it gave them more presence in Latin America where Chrysler was pretty big. It, it all made sense. Well, they screwed the whole thing up, didn't work. And poor Chrysler, which had already been bankrupt once or twice and really been through the ringer, it ends up in the hands of a, a crazy Italian guy, uh, Sergio Marchioni and Fiat. And Fiat was kind of a basket case too, historically. And then I thought, well, Nah, this this is never going to work. And that one did work. He actually turned uh, Chrysler <laughs> around, made it a great company. Jeep is stronger than it's ever been in its history. Uh, one of the first articles I put on the website was the history of Jeep. I, you know, a handful of things, the success, the Fred Smith story, a, a obsession with your customers, talking to your customers, making their life better every day, because it is so easy to get caught up in big merger deals and dealing. Uh, I always, when I talk to entrepreneurs, Real entrepreneurs do not like spending time with lawyers and investment bankers. They're all nice people. They tend to be very smart people. You know, a lot of high IQ lawyers and investment bankers tend to be interesting. And you hear a lot of, you you know, you learn a lot from them and all that. And they're fun to be around. And a lot of them are rich and they have nice parties and all that, you know. But uh, a real entrepreneur wants to be with their customers and with their employees. You know, I remember meeting with a guy. He was running a billion dollar pizza chain in Canada. Uh, lifelong restaurant tour, and it was at the big national restaurant convention. We're sitting around. And you could tell the guy was really nervous in a way, really uncomfortable at this big convention. That he really wanted to be out behind the restaurant, pouring out hot grease at the end of a shift. You know, yeah, he, he wanted to be in touch with it, right? And and that is so easy to lose. And to the extent that managers c- kind of come in at a high level, um, it sounds like I'm really knocking the MBAs. A lot of my friends are MBAs. I've taught a lot of MBAs. There are a lot of good ones, a lot of great ones, but there are also a lot who like expect to expect to become a CEO. Mm-hmm. And even no matter where they come into the company, uh, well, I'm going to run it someday. And actually, I read there was an article or a study at one point that was almost like a menopause thing where their MBAs reach 35, 40, I think, age bracket. And a fair number of them realize I'm never going to run a company that I was really cut out to be a senior vice president or whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. and that they, they, you know, either get depressed or, you know, have issues with that uh, when they realize, no, I'm, you know, it's, it's a very, 
Uh, well, hey, when I was 12, I thought someday I'd run a giant department store. Now the department store industry has changed so much, I wouldn't want to run one today. But at that point, they were huge and powerful, the Macy's and Marshall Fields of the world and all that. And, um, you know, but I worked in the industry for two big companies. And I worked uh, essentially directly for the CEO of one of the giant companies doing acquisition research and where to put new stores and all that and learned a huge amount. I loved the job, but I also realized oh, I'm never going to come anywhere close to being the CEO of one of these outfits. It's just the, the set of skills it takes. And then it's a narrow pyramid. You know, yeah. you've got a you've got a company with 100,000 employees. There's one CEO. You know, right. And also I. I have to say, because I've studied proxy statements all my life, which are the documents that tell you how much the executives get paid. And in the first edition of our Hoover's Guide to Big Business, we listed the pay of all the executives. We are the first reference book to put all that out there uh, for consumers to see. And uh, overall, I think CEOs of giant companies earn every penny they're paid. I mean, you know, they really, the, the, um, when people, I just did an interview the other day, a university thing, and the, the interviewer asked me, well, with, with all the power that companies have, and I said, well, I said, I started out, companies have power with a capital P, the way it's thrown around these days. They, no company can make me buy something that I don't mm -hmm. want to buy. No company can make me work for them. You know, the power is only the power that we give them because they make good products or whatever, and we can easily take it away from them. But when you look at the head of a company, Man, you have the unions, you have uh, labor uh, issues, you have your stockholders, you have corporate raiders, you have competitors, you have uh, city, state, county, federal regulations from antitrust to environmental things to zoning. I know you can't build that here. Uh, you get approval to build something and then it gets yanked on you and then it gets approved again and then it gets yanked again and you've spent millions on it. We've all heard that one recently. Um, and then all of a sudden you have BLM and Me Too, and you're supposed to make public comments or take a position on that, or some people want you to. If you make a small accident in, in an ad and say something that offends someone, then you've got to go on the news and issue press releases and either apologize or not apologize. <laughs> I mean, there are so, so many things come out at you. And, and then when you add the ego issues and the investment bankers that want to buy your company or sell your company and the lawyers and all this and and um you know it, it's just a hard job but the thing is all those things detract because in that same interview they asked me about corporate social responsibility and i said well i i believe in call it do-gooding do you know i i lost all my money on my third venture i live on social security now but i gave the university of chicago enough money for a dormitory enough Hoover stock and stuff. <laughs> um, so I, be I believe in, you know, philanthropy and all that. Now I, I have a 501c3, but I have seen so many businesses, especially small mom and pop retail stores and stuff, where the owner was at the, either in the Chamber of Commerce, uh, which I'm in our local one now, um, uh, out uh, fundraising, United Way, uh, often at the country club with their buddies, uh, they weren't talking to customers. And then when they go broke, they blame Walmart. You're with me? I mean, you, yeah. You, focus, focus is so critically important. And all those things I've listed take away from your focus. Well, well you focus on your labor and your employees and all that. That 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 is at the core. That's right there with focusing on your customers. Um, but man, that's you know that's where where your head has got to be at. And, right. and there are so many things that can take you away from that. And, and then the last thing I'll add is these people, they start at a low level, work their way up and all that. They become detached from it. If you study the, the decline of the U.S. auto industry, General Motors, Ford and Chrysler in the global markets. Well, back in the 30s, when they had the big strikes, that a wall was built between labor and management. And no one, when I went to my 50th high school reunion, about half the people there were ex-GM people. And then of that half, about half were used to work on the line in the United Auto Workers Union, and about half were in management or engineering or finance. And, you know, there was a wall. You never moved between them. After that happened, nobody ran a U.S. auto company who had actually built a car. 
Whereas the original people in the industry prior to the 30s had all were mechanic. Henry Ford was a mechanical tinker and Alfred P. Sloan engineering degree from MIT, you know, at least had some dirt under their fingernails. On the other hand, if you look at the restaurant industry, my guess would be all the giant restaurant companies, at least half of their CEOs started, uh, you know, um, uh, work in the counter <laughs> or, mm-hmm. or behind the bar or washing dishes. The, the whole industry is full of people who love it and are deeply engaged in it at every detail level. And, and that's been an incredibly successful industry, one of America's great industries. And I think their future is actually brighter than ever, the ones that survived the COVID mess. So that is a real long answer to this. some of the <laughs> no, things it's, about it's good. success and failure. So I, yeah, I think, you know, some of that might sound a bit intuitive, you know, and to, to the extent that, um, you know, you need to focus on customers, you need to focus on and not get distracted with a lot of this other stuff. I wonder how have, how have you seen business change since maybe the 1970s and the 1980s where, you know, I think, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but the MBA is a relatively new degree. It didn't, you know, it didn't, it didn't come about. It wasn't one of the first uh, areas of study that you could learn at a university. Right. Uh, so, how has that sort of changed the landscape? How is, and how has the landscape changed uh, more generally? I mean, obviously, globalization has uh, played a, a big role, but there's certainly companies that have been able to benefit from that greatly. So, so how how have you seen that change in the past four decades or so? Yeah, you know, some of the things that come into my mind on the MBA issue, I think um, in some ways that may have peaked. Uh, I mean, that was um, really required uh, in a lot of businesses like Wall Street and stuff by the 1970s. You know, I, I actually became a securities analyst and didn't have an MBA. I was the only one out of like 50 on my floor that didn't have an MBA except for the head guy who had come into the system uh, before it all was Hmm. required. And they let me in because I really had studied retailing since I was 12 and all that. And and I covered covered retailing. Uh, I remember they were shocked. uh, Oh, he's never had an accounting class. He's going to be analyzing financial statements. He better take a night school class. So I went and took it and got the best grade in the class and didn't go to any of the classes because I've been (laughs) reading annual reports since I was 12, you know? Yeah. I mean, it was like second nature to me. Uh, even though I'd never had it, you know, in a formal classroom, uh, but um, and I think some companies found out it, it doesn't pay off, uh, you know, the extra degrees. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not even sure what Warren Buffett says about it, but I'm guessing he and his buddy Charlie Munger are somewhat skeptical. You know that you know that if you stay U.S. presidents, I remember talking to one of my students. He said, "Well, why don't why don't we have geniuses as presidents? You know, why don't we have people with the highest IQs?" I said, because it would be a disaster, you know, and the last thing you'd want would be the whole nation run by the Harvard faculty, you know, who are wonderful, great right. people and do great research and everything. But, you know, uh, there are a lot of types of intelligence. Uh, I, that whole IQ thing is one of them. But I have seen so much in my business life, uh, high school dropouts who had a better understanding of people, a better emotional intelligence, as they say. Uh, there are people who are just street smart. There are people that can read other people. There are people that have intuition. Um, and, and so I know at one point Goldman Sachs really preferred people with at least a um, liberal arts undergraduate degree and often would take people. And, and Goldman's company with very, very high standards and a lot of really, really bright people in my experience. Uh, but they would just soon have get somebody with a B.A teach them. And, and actually, there's an investment uh, a service called Value Line that's been around a long time. And he didn't care about any degree. He gave them an IQ test. And so, look, if they have a high IQ, I can teach them to be a stock analyst. And for many, many years, they had one of the best batting averages of any uh, uh, advisory service outfit that says this is a good stock, this is not a good stock, and still still going, still a wonderful service you can subscribe to. But um, so I think that the MBA in certain industries, yeah, uh, you got to have one. Uh, I think Wall Street investment management uh, more than likely. Um, but on in other industries, and, and some companies found out, hey, we hired a bunch that didn't really work away from it. I think maybe in the grocery store industry, you saw some of it. There was a big company in Chicago uh, called Jewel Tea that had grocery stores in Chicago, very great company. And they went on this thing where it was all MBAs and brought them all in. And 
it it didn't turn out that well. They didn't achieve their projections, later got bought by another company. Um, so I think that's uh, kind of peaked. Um, the globalization thing, I mean, that's one thing uh, when I look at the Fortune 500, and then they also back then in the 60s, when I started reading it, they had a separate list of like the 100 or 200 biggest non-US companies. And when I started there in 1963, General Motors was, uh, I think, twice as big in terms of annual revenues, sales, the best way to rank company size, um, it, twice as big as the biggest foreign company which is Royal Dutch Shell. Well, if you look at that list now, and I did a post on our American business history uh, site about the um, biggest companies in the world. Um, it, you know, it's like the top four or five, or four or five of the top five are, are Chinese. Now they're state owned companies. So I'm not sure if they really belong in the list. Um, the biggest company on earth is Walmart. Uh, it was mm. the first company in the history of the world to hit uh, 500 billion in annual revenues uh, like two years ago, I guess it was. And they're, they're still still there, the biggest company on earth. Um, but the share of companies that are U.S. companies is way down. The one Among the top 20, it's gone from being, I think, 17 down to uh, six or something like that. And and you're going to see more and more, you know, companies coming out. The Southern Hemisphere is beginning to show up. Uh, companies from Brazil, you know, the South African company. There'll be more Australian companies. Uh, but China and India, obviously. Uh, Mexico has a lot more big uh, global uh, powerhouses than it mm -hmm. used to have. Um, so you're seeing this shifting. And at the same time, a lot of the great American companies get well over half of their profits from outside the U.S. And that's been true of companies like Coca-Cola and stuff for a long time. Colgate Palm Olive found in 1806, but buying their stock is a great way to invest in Latin America because they're so strong down there. So, you know, it's all it's all getting blurred. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and, and the leaders of the companies, that's a, a huge challenge dealing with all the different cultures around the world and how to deal with it. And, and it's very hard to see patterns like Walmart had to give up in Germany and South Korea. It just didn't work. And now they're selling their British operation. On the other hand, Mexico has been a huge home run. And I believe they've been very successful in China. Uh, Costco has gone into a lot of countries with success. Toys R Us was one of the first to go all over the world and be successful pretty much everywhere it went. But other companies, I mean, it's very tricky. Uh, it feel like retailing, which is so culture embedded in the culture in the society you know, the local patterns, they're all different and you have to adapt to them. And then what share of your people are, are locals in the management team, uh, you know, or you fly in a bunch of people from the United States. And so there are lots of um, historic mistakes. Uh, and, 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 and the other thing too, is a lot of things, they aren't on a, a, a straight trend line. They go back and forth. In other words, General Motors in the 1920s bought the biggest automaker in Germany. It was called the Adam Opel Company, and they ran it for years, and I think they made a lot of money for some years, but then they ended up, uh, later it became a money loser, and now they've sold out of their European operations. Ford was really big in Europe, and, you know, they've all had their ups and downs. It, it, it's kind of like in technology, we tend to think, well, things advance in one direction, you know, so we've gone from being wired to being wireless, right? Well, the U.S. television broadcasting system was completely wireless. And then we switched to wired when we went to cable. So it went the opposite direction. Yeah. You know? right. So you can't always and, tell how it's going right. to go. And, and sometimes things, you know, they're pendulums. They swing back and forth. I mean, vinyl records were totally dead. And now they're cool and they're in again. You right. know? <laughs> and, you know, ebooks were growing faster than print books for a while, but now print books are growing much faster than ebooks. And ebook. <laughs> trend kind of you know peaked out um so uh yeah who knows maybe someday newspapers will be back yeah like maybe it's printed on paper maybe um, i'm not predicting that well, one one trend, you know, when I think about business uh, in the United States context, you know, we at Archbridge, we work a lot on trying to create climates of entrepreneurship, obviously, you know, more opportunities, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, one thing that really sticks out that a lot of people in the policy world are concerned about is since the 1970s, we've seen um, a pretty steep decline in the rate of business dynamism, right? So we've seen fewer businesses starting up 
as compared with those that are going under, going out of business. Uh, and so that used to be fairly high. And now it's been on that downward trajectory for about 50 years now. So do you think that Americans are less entrepreneurial than they than they were at that time? Or is there something else going on here? So why? what do you think explains that decline in business dynamism? Uh, yeah, and that's a that's a fascinating question, and one that uh, my friend uh, Gonzalo Schwartz and I have, have uh, emailed back and forth about at some length. <laughs> I tell you, my so I started out. The whole world was big corporations, you know, uh, giant companies in the '60s, and that's where all the focus was. And then I, I worked for big retailers. That was my whole world. I was living in St. Louis, where the main department stores company was headquartered. I worked at their corporate headquarters. And I, by then, had realized why well, I, I want to start my own bookstore chain. And I'd done seven years of research and everything, but I'd go to parties, uh, you know, all the people from the company. And, oh, you're going to go start a company? Well, what's that all about? You know, what's wrong with you? It just was not in there. Now, May, uh, St. Louis is a very corporate town. At that point, you had Monsanto and Ralston Purina and a bunch of big companies based there and May. None of which are based there anymore. They all got bought and the headquarters got moved and all that. There are now other big companies there, but I think maybe only Emerson Electric was one of the old big ones that's still headquartered there. That was big when I lived there in the, the 70s. Um, and, you know, and then I moved to Texas, picked Austin as the best place to start the bookstore chain and went to lawyers. And lawyers didn't know much about startups. I had to go around and find ones that have you ever done a private placement memorandum? Uh, yeah, in oil and gas, but not for a retail chain. I did a lot of my own legal work. Well, fast forward to today, Austin, of course, is a hotbed for entrepreneurship. But when I picked it and moved there in 1982, there wasn't, weren't many startups going on. Whole Foods Market was uh, founded a few years uh, before I got there. And I later served on their board and friends of mine saw their whole chain evolve. Um, but there just wasn't much going on. And, and uh, you couldn't find accountants who understood startups and all the issues. And it was hard to find lawyers and, and hard to find investors. I don't I, I think I'm probably on the money. There are probably 40 incubators in Austin, incubators and co-working spaces. But the whole field gets blurred. You know, mm -hmm. there are. Uh, I, well, before COVID. I would guess I, I could probably go to four meetups or face-to-face -face meetings or seminars a week about how to start companies. And okay, well, that's Austin, but look on Forbes and all these other you know websites and stuff, best cities to start a company in. Well, that used to be Silicon Valley and Boston, and then they added Austin. Well, now it's Jacksonville and it's Chattanooga and it's Tucson and it's Salt Lake City and it's, you know, Green Bay, Wisconsin or whatever. You know, the list goes on and on and everybody's got um, um, uh, incubators. Everybody, My hometown, Anderson, Indiana, has a beautiful incubator. They have <laughs> two of them now and they've started. So when I see those numbers, my first reaction is not to believe them. Hmm. Know, the whole sensation of entrepreneurship in this country over the last 50 years has taken off. My only guess, and I tried to do some research on it, look at the numbers, because most of that data is based on business formations, how many incorporations there are at the legal level. You know, it's right. very hard to get your hands around real startup data. And I know people try but it's not an easy thing. I th Some of the things I think might be going on, one is that with tax law changes and stuff, there maybe used to be a lot more separate corporations. For example, there was a big shoe store chain I covered on Wall Street, and they had, I forget, 2,000 stores, let's say. Every store was a separate corporation because of the way the tax law worked. It later changed, and they all became one corporation. But people incorporate stuff all the time. No oil and gas business. You know, every... Every parcel out here in the countryside, I live kind of in rural Texas now, and there are pump jacks, you know, oil wells all around me. And each of those little parcels is a little LLC or a little incorporation. So one of the things is I'd really like to dig into it. How many of them are like real companies with employees rather than just really a tax legal structure? Other ones created in the 50s and 60s, everybody's looking back at. Um, how many of them? And then the other thing is how many of them intended to get big. I mean, we have always had a high startup and a high failure rate 
of independent retail stores and restaurants. I would be very surprised if that has, those percentages have changed in 50 years, right? You, you, people mm -hmm. start them all the time. They think it's easy to run a bar or a restaurant or, you know, all these uh, romantic <laughs> businesses. And then they find out, oh, I wasn't really cut out for that. It, it just happens all the time. It always has. Um, as far as startups, and I have friends working on a project about the 1960s saying, look, it wasn't all just hippies and rebellion in the Vietnam War. There were companies started and things invented. He's creating a website about it to kind of give the 60s a different brand kind of name. And, and it's fascinating. Um, and there's no question, because you kind of sense the 50s was a dead time for starting major companies. But but there were. Holiday Inns rose up to power. They, they took on the whole hotel industry and became the biggest out of Memphis, Tennessee. McDonald's, late 50s, early 60s, was mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. beginning to build up steam. So there's no question there have always been them. But, you know, uh, there weren't the hot IPOs. There weren't the hot tech companies. There were a few, you know, Tektronics, you know, and uh, Xerox, you know, and so on but not like the last 10 or 20 years. So I think perhaps the reality is that there are a lot more companies being founded now that intend to become large, that are not just an oil and gas field or one store or a mom and pop store. I see, okay, so that could explain some of what we're seeing in the data. That's an yes. interesting perspective that it's maybe not quite as different as it might look if you're just glossing over. Yes, this, because my, this. my sense being on the ground and in the field, and now I probably, I'm guessing 10,000 business plans. I've judged business plan competitions and all over the world, in Portugal and Colombia. I've been to 45 countries. I've talked about entrepreneurship. And man, it's going nuts out there. It, it is hmm. unprecedented the degree to which there is enthusiasm for entrepreneurship. How, how many in 1960, how many colleges had a, an entrepreneurship course or an entrepreneurship department? Zero, pretty sure. 1960, yeah. 1970, zero. How many don't have one now? About zero. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's a big no, shift. It has, it's gone nuts. It's gone nuts. So I just, um, uh, no, no. And I could make a case it's overblown. In fact, when I give my course in entrepreneurship that I gave at the university and then on my own, I always, at least in my own head, say uh, successful 25% of the people at the end of this course will say, I don't want to start a company because I'm very clear about all the things that are difficult about it. And mm -hmm. I talk my own brother out of starting a, a business. You know, a lot of people really aren't cut out for it. And the sooner they discover that, the better. And it will save them a lot of grief and a lot of money and won't ruin their friendships and their relatives pissed oh, off man. at them for bad investment. You know, you, you can't. I mean, it's always you're rolling the dice when you start anything, any business. Sure. So you can't make any guarantees. But and and uh, but but still, it's it's not for everybody. And I see people all the time who I meet with and think, well, I mean, there are odds of being successful are less. Now, I always do everything I can to move them in the right direction to help. Okay, you ought to do this and, you know, give them some guidance. I never tell somebody, oh, you, you shouldn't even be an entrepreneur. But right. um, sometimes I wonder. And and so so my feeling is it, it's strong as ever been. I mean, look at the support groups at Kaufman Foundation. And, uh, and, and the other thing, too, is even people who are left politically, and you look at surveys, everybody loves entrepreneurship. Yeah. Every, everybody believes in funding their local community entrepreneurship workshop. Everybody. Um, and now I, I live in a town of 1,300 people. And I can tell you, there wasn't a lot of entrepreneurship here now. Uh, it wasn't here. But now all of a sudden, we've got three or four new businesses in our old historic downtown. Young people are moving here. They're starting things. A movie theater was closed for like 50 years, and it just reopened this last weekend. Uh, uh, you know, off to a, a restart. Um, so it's not just Austin, it's even getting out here in the sticks, you know, right. and we're having a workshop with a, a small business administration about what things, you know, are available to all these uh, new people with new ideas. So I, I, I think it couldn't be stronger. And the other thing is it's global. Now, the U.S. has always been the best place for entrepreneurship. It just is in every way. 
and I go to these other countries and I know like in Mexico, which I love, I've been to like 19 of the 31 states there. I lead little tour, small group tours in Mexico City. I love the country. But down there, man, the thing is an investor would never invest in somebody they're not related to. They mm -hmm. never invest in somebody they haven't known for 40 years. I raised $350,000 start book stop. And while my friends did invest, it's like 80% of the money came from people I didn't know 90 days before that, you know, before they wrote the check. Right. All people, well, I got a friend, go talk to them. That, that ain't happening in most of the world. And I use that as kind of a measure to the extent I see that begin to happen in these developing nations, term I'm not crazy about, you know, underdeveloped and all that. Uh, um, when I see that, when, when I go to Mexico and I see, oh yeah, I raised money from these people I'd never met before, you know, I'm that, you know, now you're getting somewhere and you're making progress. So I, I think it's a global thing and I think nothing's gonna stop. But now, now I do have to say, there's a lot of silliness. People say, I'm gonna create a unicorn, you know, a company that's worth a billion dollars like overnight. Yeah, um, well that's what everybody time. wants. <laughs> oh, not me, man. And, and I mean, I, I would love to create a company that became worth a billion dollars, but it's just the wrong way to look at it. And and I got to say, because uh, I've judged a lot of the stuff, these pitch contest stuff, there's just a lot of silliness. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how, you know, what's my PowerPoint, my deck look like, you know? And mm -hmm. how am I the best person at giving a 10 minute presentation? Um, it's so I, I, I teach how to do a business plan and everything. I have an outline of what makes her a great business plan. And when I, when I look at so many business school, MBA types, so on, their spreadsheets are perfect. Everything adds up, but there's no heart. There's no soul in the business. And then I look at people like that are 55, been corporate all their life. Now they want to start a company. Sometimes there's all this heart and soul. It's like poetry, but the spreadsheets don't add up. You mm -hmm. know? Neither one of those is going to work. Okay. Yeah. You have the, the words and the numbers both have to be great. The sentiment, the heart and the mind both have to work, you know, um, and, and because uh, starting a company, building a successful enterprise, it takes all the all those things. And if you don't have the skills, you either have to learn them and get good at them or find someone who is and get them on your side, whether it's an outsider, like an accountant or a lawyer. That does you know not an employee or an employee, uh, no matter how you do it, uh, but but ultimately great entrepreneurs have this incredible self confidence in their ability to master anything, either themselves or find people who can support their efforts. That confidence is critical to to uh, to succeeding. Okay, well, one thing that you touched on a little bit earlier that I want to kind of come back to is. So just, just a few months ago, last September in 2020, we marked the 50th anniversary of Milton Friedman's famous essay discussing the social responsibility of business. Oh, yeah. Um, and so to paraphrase him a little bit, he famously argued uh, that their business only responsibility is to increase profits. Uh, so what do you think that he got right, if anything? And where, where do you think he went wrong? How, how do you feel about how he discussed that uh, business role in society. Uh, yes, yes. And I have had lots of conversations and even written some stuff, uh, I think, on the Archbridge site uh, about profit and uh, what yes. it means. What I have said many times in public and everything is that I agree with Milton Friedman on about 90, 95, 99 percent of everything he said. He's a wonderful man. I, I had dinner with him and his wife when they were in their 90s. I got to know him and I had had him in class many years earlier. Uh, his work, his thinking, uh, wonderful. The one thing where I disagreed with him was on that point. Or if you phrase it this way, and I don't think that's the way he originally phrased it. If you phrase it, the purpose of business is to make a profit because the uh, the words can get pretty slippery. And I always say no to say that the purpose of business is to make a profit is like saying your purpose is to carry around your heart and your brain. You know, now without them, you're what we call dead, you know, right. and with your lungs and your liver and a lot of other stuff, right? <clears throat> so they're absolutely required, they're critically important, but they're not your purpose. Well, profit is so important and it's just as important to nonprofit organizations as for profit i get so tired of well we we're, we're better because we don't make a profit no any organization 
that spends more than it takes in ain't going to be around <laughs> very long. And uh, nonprofits just use different terms, museums, universities, they call it earned income, auxiliary income, they use all these different things. But I can tell you, some of them are more money grubbing and greedy than some of the companies I know, you know, not all, not all. And I obviously do believe in nonprofits uh, like my business history thing and University of Chicago and Archbridge and so on. But um, uh, profits and, and, uh, and profits, they don't come from screwing your workers. Costco is the highest paying major retail chain in America and the lowest price major retailer in America. Mm -hmm. Southwest Airlines is among the highest paying airlines and among the most value oriented airlines. Now, that's because they're both highly productive companies. They're well and they, they're focused on what they do and they do it incredibly well. Um, profits don't drive prices up. Um, the profit motive is what led Toyota to take on General Motors <laughs> and, and kind of kill them, you know, by mm -hmm. making better cars for lower prices. Uh, the profit motive is what drove Walmart to dethrone Kmart and Sears by offering more stuff at lower prices in more places, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we go on and on and on, you know, throughout industries, you know. Profit motive is what made Microsoft and Apple and all those guys begin to slay IBM as the biggest computer maker on earth and to break it up and make computers and the software accessible. Um, so, so I love profit and I really believe it. And you can read on the Archbridge site my long article about the uh, – well, I think the 10 myths about profitability. Mm -hmm. I'll link it here. So, too. Uh, yeah, it's great. Great. So I, you know, uh, I, I think the words get blurred because I don't think Milton Friedman actually said the purpose of business to make a profit. He said priority. Now, having said all that, his concern, which I do share, relates to what I said a minute ago about uh, companies beginning to lose their focus. Uh, taking shareholder money or money that could have gone to employ pay raises or money that could have gone to lowering the price of the products and giving that money to the CEO or the board's favorite charity to look good to their friends, you know, their peers, kind of like I was saying about academics, you know, mm -hmm. uh, when a CEO of a company is more worried about what other CEOs think of him or her. <laughs> then he is worried, he or she is worried about what their customers think of them. It's over with. That's it's the end. It may take years, like it did for Sears, to decline. But the minute you take your eye off your customers, your products, your services, I was reading about a guy. He'd, he'd done several startups. One, he raised three hundred million or something, and later sold the company for thirteen million dollars. And they're interviewing him about well, what did you do wrong? And he said, Oh, he said we just put enough emphasis into the product department. So it's like he's thinking, oh, we got a legal department, a finance department, a, a marketing department, a product department. No, no, all, all it is is your product. You with me? I mean, your product yeah. and your service is the whole story. It ain't just some little department. It ain't just one of 10, you know, chess pieces on the board, however you want to think about, you know, business. And, and that's a, a, a fundamental flaw that will destroy any business. And so... When I see the big companies getting involved in all the social stuff, and like I said, it, you can't avoid it. People are going to call you and want to interview you. And, well, why didn't you speak up on that issue? And it's just kind of a nightmare. And, and the other thing, too, is the bigger the company, you have a target on your back. So uh, um, not meant to be a pun, but company, uh, cities ban Walmart effectively. Oh, stop Walmart. But they don't do the same thing to target Right? No. This target's cool. <laughs> and <laughs> and I'm sure you people at Target are like throwing parties. Hey, you see that town just kick Walmart in the butt? Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and so, you know, uh, uh, both Microsoft and Walmart, you know, end up being targets, uh, targets of, of government inquiries or antitrust investigations, General Motors, IBM. None of them had those issues when they were smaller. And in fact, you can find evidence, certainly at General Motors, that, that they hit a 52% or something market share of US auto sales back around 1961. And that was the highest they ever got. And you can say part of it was competition, Ford and Chrysler, because that was before um, first Volkswagen and then Toyota and the Japanese guys ramped up in the US. 
But uh, if you study, there's a good chance they had management meetings and said, look, we can't go above 52. Stop, stop pushing. You with me? Mm-hmm. Stop, in a sense, stop innovating. Stop driving the organization. You with me? Because if we hit 53 or 54, the government's going to break us up for sure. Yeah, and, that's and, interesting. And, yeah, and I, I think you can find other cases. And that's hard to discover because internal thinking of management not except for a, a very good fortune or Wall Street Journal reporter, it's very rare to really get inside their heads and inside right. those meetings, you know. But so, uh, yeah. How would you say that this sort of overlaps with conscious capitalism? So can you describe a little bit about what what that is and how how that sort of relates to this discussion about Friedman and, and what he thought about business? Yes. Do you think it's opposed to him or do you think it's sort of complimentary or how do you how do you think about yeah yeah no, that's a great one uh, and i have to tell you i was kind of there at the birth uh, somebody told me i was the godfather of conscious capitalism because <laughs> i introduced john Mackey, the whole foods founder to michael strong who helped create all that and um and they they created that got it rolling um and and now it's become huge and john's written a couple of books about it and so on um and i'm in favor of it i'm i like conscious capitalism again to some degree you're uh, we're playing with words you know and they can get mm-hmm. slippery exactly how you define it exactly what it calls for i think and 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 it's easy to find you know john Mackey makes lots of speeches and writes books so uh, I, I shouldn't be trying to define it for them i should let your listeners look it up for themselves but it, you know the idea of being conscious about uh a broader, I mean, in some ways, kind of a new agey thing, you know, uh, that you have a lot of stakeholders is the buzzword, but but it's a real thing. I mean, I just mentioned, you know, ahead of a company, has got the stockholders, he's got the employees, he's got his suppliers, uh, the vendors, uh, you got your customers, and you have local regulator, you have a community that you're in. And I, I guess my own, my only quarrel with some of the stuff on conscious capitalism is it's often portrayed as, oh, this is a new movement and revolutionary. If you go to our um, uh, go to the American Original series, uh, there is a life story of a guy named Robert Wood. And he was a guy who became the head of Sears Roebuck in the 1920s. And it was all catalog mail order. And he only joined the company on the basis of the main owner, another wonderful guy, Julius Rosenwald, that Rosenwald would agree to let him try building stores because Sears was uh, uh, served farmers. And Wood, who was a, a demographics junkie, read a page out of the statistical abstract that the government published in the cities we need to have physical bricks and mortar stores. And um, and R- Rosenwald wasn't crazy about the idea, but said, okay, if that's what it takes for you to join our company, okay. And by 1930, over half their revenues were from the bricks and mortar stores. And then they became the largest, greatest retailer on earth for decades. And Wood ran it um, from the 20s and was really the driving force behind the company, at least into the mid 60s. Uh, amazing track record. But if you read that biography, over and over, he says, look, customers come first, employees come right behind them, the community comes, and the last on the list is the stockholders. Because if you do all those other things, then the stockholders are going to do fine. And he proved that over 30 or 40 years, his stockholders did phenomenally well. I mean, the Rosenwald family richer than ever, you know, mm-hmm. they became big philanthropists. Um, uh, in fact, the reason they hired Wood was because the old man Rosenwald wanted to spend most of his time giving his money away. He was, he was an amazing, wonderful man, un, underwritten. Someday I'm going to write up his life story. But if you study Wood, I mean, he, he defined conscious capitalism. And you can find cases of that for, in the American Original Series. We have the life story of Jim Casey, the guy who started UPS. Well, that company today has over 100,000 drivers making six figures who you couldn't pry away from there if you tried, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's just the most amazing company. And and unlike, say, Apple, the bulk of its the cash flow, it goes to its employees, not its stockholders. If you look at the ratio of how much money goes to the employees to how much goes to the stockholders, Walmart and um, UPS are very high that goes to the employees. Apple, very low as a share of the of the cash flow from operations divided between the war between labor and capital you want to use that uh, phrase um and um so there have always been conscious capitalists 
and they succeeded, you know, in that broad sense of the word. But um, no, there was a, at a big annual event called Freedom Fest, there was a big debate uh, between John Mackey and another fellow about conscious capitalism and, and uh, the stockholders got to come first or not. And uh, at the end, the audience clap for who they liked. And I, I'm, I'm with conscious capitalism. So I'm, I'm curious about some of the conscious capitalism stuff. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Just one last question for you before we close out here. Uh, but it's a two-parter. So one two-part question here. After years of looking into business history and studying it and entrepreneurship, what is the one thing that you would want to communicate to the public policy community? That's the first part. And the one thing that you would want to communicate to a student who's maybe looking to go into business? Those are both big questions. <laughs> um, let, me try, let me try the student first. Um, that'll be a little less controversial. Sure. Uh, you know, be curious. Be curious about everything. Uh, ideally, uh, get a liberal arts education. I don't care whether you get it on a college campus or go into the library, and you still have to use books. Uh, my experience is at least 60 or 70 percent of what is in my 57,000 book library is not online, and that always shocks people. But there is so much that's under copyright that's in books, it's charts, and tables, and graphs, and pictures. Uh, there is just a huge amount out there that is not online. So yeah, you can't just live online. But as soon as you can, try to find what industry you love. You know, this idea, oh, if you can manage one thing, you can manage anything and it's all, no, that's, that's nonsense. You know, there, there are a handful, there are very few people that that's true of. Sometimes sequentially an entrepreneur, I started businesses in different industries, but I spent between one and seven years before each startup studying, becoming an expert in the industry. And the ones where I studied the most and knew the most is, are the ones where I was the most successful. Um, you know, uh, try, do internships, talk to everybody, talk to, when I realized I loved retailing, I was 13 or 14, I wrote a term paper, The Life Story of Marshall Field. So that was my first biography I wrote in eighth grade. Okay. And, but then I went to Kmart and Sears and mom and pop and independent stores in my hometown. And I said, I want to see the manager. And I go in with my questions. And what do you like about your job? What don't you like? What's the best day you've ever had? What's the worst day? What kind of people do you look for in this industry? What, what makes her a good retailer? What, what are things you don't want to see in a retailer? And you just can't know too much. And understanding customers, you can't know too much about them. I mean, ideally, when I'm building the bookstore chain, yeah, you want to know where do they buy books? Why do they buy them there? What stores do they like? What subjects do they like? All these kind of obvious questions that any bookseller should answer. But I want to, you know, do you go to church? And which church? Do you have kids or not? How old are the kids? You know, do you have a swimming pool or not? What kind of car do you drive? What cities have you visited? Have you ever been overseas? Um, yeah, Stanley Marcus, the great retailer that built Neiman Marcus. I once interviewed him for like three hours. Wonderful man. They call him Mr. Stanley. And uh, and and he, he said, uh, actually, this was, I think, a story his son later told me that, uh, yeah, you, you'd ask women what hem length do you like, fabrics do you like, and all that, because Neiman makes most of his money selling women's apparel. And he said, but but dad, he said his main thing was what countries did you most recently visit? What plays did you see? What books did you read? Because he wanted to really be inside their head. So finding an industry you love, if, if you're in any direct to consumer business, hotels, restaurants, retailing, even online retailing, you know, you've got to get in the head of the customers. You've got to love the customer. Oh, I, ju I, I just answered a big Quora question about what are the worst things about working in retailing? And there are all these long answers. Oh, it's just awful. The customers are stupid. And if you talk back to a customer, you get fired because your bosses never defend you. And on and on, all different permutations of how awful, including some people that worked in it like 20 years. And I, I kind of lost my cool. And I'm like, kind of, I kind of said, well, I can't believe. Why would you say 20 years in it? And I said, look, it's a different kind of person, a person that wants to become a nurse. A person wants to become a flight attendant, a per, you know, a person wants to wait tables, a person wants to clerk in a store. It's a different kind of person that puts a higher value on serving others than serving themselves. 
And if you aren't that kind of person, you should stay away from it. You know, Madonna could never have built Federal Express. Fred Smith could have never built Microsoft. Bill Gates could not have built Walt Disney Company. Walt Disney probably couldn't have built hardly anything. He's my all-time favorite entrepreneur, and I wrote his biography for American Originals. But, you know, man, that was a guy who was focused on one thing. Most of these guys, most men and women, because Estee Lauder. Amazing. She was nuts, man. She mixed all this stuff up in her mother's kitchen and got her aunt's formula or whatever. And she'd go up to taxi drivers and people on the street and say, oh, I could improve your complexion and start dabbing stuff <laughs> on their face. Apparently did that till the day she died. And all her grandkids are billionaires from the empire she built. So, you know, find something you love. And, and I've written plenty uh, it's all over. I have another website called Hoover's World. I, I've got over 100, maybe 200 YouTube videos. A bunch of them are entrepreneurship tips. There's a thing called the uh, Six Simple Steps to Building a Great Company. Read read all that kind of stuff. Uh, if you want to come up with new ideas, read the book, The Innovator's DNA, the best book uh, written on that. I, I recently did a post on Hoover's World about, I think, four key books to help you come up with ideas. Um Man, be curious. Learn, learn, learn. I mean, that's that's certainly the starting point uh, on business. Re uh, read anything Peter Drucker wrote. His book, I never remember the full title, is Management, colon, Tasks, Responsibilities, and something else. Something like that. Read that book. It's the original edition, not the 20th anniversary or whatever, where they started messing around. He was really the greatest thinker about business who was not an active business person himself. So many business people are not introspective, you know, just like a great basketball player often cannot tell you how how they did it. It just comes mm -hmm. naturally. And that's true. of So many great leaders, too, I think. Um, whereas Drucker was on the outside and, and really. And, and when we're talking about Milton Friedman, the one thing I'd say, uh, another statement I make a lot is I'm always amazed at how little economists know about business and how little business people know about economics. The number of business people don't really understand supply and demand, price theory, as we called it, a uh, big chunk of microeconomics. Um, and likewise, you know, when I, when I got to know uh, uh, Milton better, um, he, he couldn't have run a company, you know, he, he never right. had to meet a payroll, you know, it's, it's a different world. And how you motivate people, you go to a, a, a group of 10 employees or 100,000 employees and say, hey, you know, uh, we're, I, I want to maximize our shareholder value. Now, if you make them all shareholders, like Sears did under Wood and under Rosenwald, it was the leader in that, given stock to the employees, or public supermarkets in Florida, which is entirely mm -hmm. employee-owned, then that message all works. But when you got a mom and pop store and you won't give any of the equity or ownership or any profit sharing your employees. Um, and, and the other thing is, that if, if you say, well, this is all about you employees, and it isn't, they're going to see right through that. People are smart. So, yeah. Um, uh, you know, economics and business um, when they when they meet. My other uh, great economics teacher, George Stigler, who was uh, one of Milton Friedman's best friends, maybe his best friend. Uh, he actually, I thought, had a, a real feel for how it integrated. He was a very real world, as Friedman was too. I um, mean, he really had a touch for common people. His whole life was devoted. How do we lift people out of poverty? And it's yeah. uh, Gary Becker, another great economist said that Milton Friedman did more to lift people of the world out of poverty than any other single person. So long one on that. Public policy. Well, I just mentioned George Stigler. George Stigler, uh, my major within economics in college was industrial organization, which means antitrust, monopoly, oligopoly, all that. And I love all that stuff. I've been studying that for uh, going on 60 years too. I, I start with antitrust because that's a field that I'm closest to and have studied the most and and looked at the most cases too. I look at cases from the 20s and 30s and when it all started, the trust busters with Teddy Roosevelt and everything, the breakup of Standard Oil Trust in like 1911, 1912, whatever. I, I haven't seen any evidence that antitrust ever really works. There are probably a couple of cases somewhere that I haven't discovered. But when I say works, makes the world better by its actions. It takes millions of dollars. Now the problem is with the government budget in the trillions, you know, I, I just watch them on the bill they're passing right now. 
Uh, well, yeah, but we didn't put much money into that. That's only 50 billion. You know, oh, how many companies I could start <laughs> with 50 billion dollars? You know, how many jobs you could create? So you lose track. So when some antitrust thing only cost 100 million of taxpayer money, it's well, why even talk about it as pocket change? And no, it's real money. Um, the market does a much better job. If a company doesn't provide a good service to its customers, if it doesn't give them good value for their money, if it doesn't, can't compete, it's going to go away. It can take time. It's just like, you know, reaching equilibrium. If you study supply and demand, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, and sometimes it's a moving target. So it keeps moving uh, somewhere. But um, I, I actually, um, I haven't even mentioned this to anybody yet, but I'm making a list of uh, future articles I want to write for Archbridge. And just uh, uh, the last uh, 24 hours, I put down, well, I had one, uh, why I don't trust antitrust. <laughs> I, I think that one was already on my list. But the one I added was the decline of Amazon and Google, which mm. I think would be a, a title that might get people to read it because oh they're yeah. so popular. they're monopolies well first of all i answered a question on quora they say well oh, you know how can you anyone say that amazon is not a monopoly and i responded by saying amazon has under five percent of the u.s retail market and monopoly is defined as a hundred percent so right now they're about 95 points shy you know <laughs> um, yeah. google in search I think is around 70%. That's much closer, still not a monopoly by the definition of the word monopoly, but that's a lot. I have written notes to myself and some of my friends about how you could take on Google. Uh, it's gonna take somebody with a lot of courage, you know, a lot of guts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but an Elon Musk, you know, wouldn't take as much courage and guts as he has, you know, right. and no more than Jeff Bezos had. Um, if these companies do a bad job, mistreat their customers, uh, um, none, none of them has. The only time monopoly power works is when you have the government behind it or in effect behind it. Uh, AT&T had something like 85% of all the telephones in the United States, and they had total control over the long distance services. Well, that was basically an agreement, a working agreement between AT&T and the government that, that that was okay. You know, uh, you have what they used to call natural monopolies, like, well, it wouldn't be worth it to have two electric companies come to my house or two water companies or two telephone companies. Some of those, like telephones, technology has done away with. It no longer is, is, you have to have a wire coming in your house. And so now you have competition in telephones. That'll probably happen in some other categories. So that, that gets a little tricky with those so-called natural monopolies, but there are fewer of them than there used to be. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, but if the government gets behind it and, and what happens so often is George Stigler call it the capture or they call it the capture theory of regulation. So like every, in the 1880s and 90s, everybody hated the railroads, right? The shippers hated them. The farmers hated them. They were the most powerful companies in America, the biggest companies in America, led by the Pennsylvania Railroad, which I wrote up in one article as one of the three greatest companies in American history, now dead. They all have their life cycles. Uh, but um, everybody hated them. So they all got to Washington. They created the Interstate Commerce Commission. Well, the interstate, the first meeting, okay, the farmers and the shippers, everybody shows up. No, this is bad about the railroads. You should make them do this and make them do that. And the ICC, Interstate Commerce Commission, basically set the prices, told them where they could build the railroads, told them when they could merge and couldn't, they couldn't. They did that for like 70, 80 years. Um, the thing is, though, at the second and third meeting of the ICC, who shows up? No, the farmers got other things to do. It was an issue. They thought they had it fixed. The shippers began not. The railroads show up. The industry takes over the thing. Hey, when Southwest Airlines tried to start up, it took them at least it was like three years of court fighting against American and Braniff, who were the big airlines here in Texas at the time, uh, trying to stop them. And the regulators were in bed with the big airlines. Regulation is usually used as a tool by big companies to keep the world the way it is, to keep out competitors. Uh, just like if you look at um, occupational licensure, you know, limiting the number of new lawyers or the, I think in Texas, nail salons have to be licensed or whatever, you yeah. know, and it's, it's, it's the, 
it's the current people, whether that be a union or a big corporation, <laughs> trying to keep upstarts, newcomers out. And you see that over and over and over again. And it isn't a matter of the ICC being good people or bad people or Democrats or Republicans. It's the nature of the beast. And finally, Jimmy Carter, a Democrat president, did away with it. He, he did away with the Civil Aeronautics Board, which played the same role for the airlines and often uh, denied requests to lower fares because, well, that wouldn't be good for the industry. Well, it wouldn't be good for some in the industry, for your friends. Right. <laughs> Anytime you mix up business and government, not good things happen. And, and I just see evidence of that over and over. And you always have unintended consequences. Like they put a, a said, oh, you got to lower, um, uh, increase the miles per gallon the automobiles get. But people felt safer in big, heavy cars. And so America moved to pickup trucks, which were not under the same rules. And pickup trucks became bigger sellers than sedans. And now they can't even sell four-door sedans. The big automakers, most of them are the American ones. They're all dropping. Their Chevys and Fords that were your basic old sedan that used to be the top sellers. Uh, pickup trucks, they're making a fortune. I saw the other day the Ford F-150, which is the biggest selling vehicle in America. The F-150 average price is close to $50,000, you know, which is what I used to think of as an electric car. I still do. Yeah. Uh, my car costs less than half that. But um, so, you know, legislators are not good at seeing the future. And that's definitely true of antitrust. They're always looking backwards. They're always, they stop the May company that I work for, Federated Department Stores, another company I work for, a big department store operator, 60s, they all, the antitrust people said, you can't buy more department stores because you're getting too big. Big alone was bad. And so those companies opened discount stores, they bought grocery stores, they bought specialty store chains, shoe store chains, all these things, children's stores, fields they didn't really understand as well. And it, it, oh, very mixed record. Overall, it didn't pay off. Well, then, and, and because the, the, the trust, the regulators saw the department stores as just competing with each other. Macy's against Gimbel's, uh, Broadway against May in Southern California, Marshall Field against Carson Perry Scott in Chicago, Wanamaker against Strawbridge in Philadelphia. Every place in America had two, three, or four of these things. They didn't see them as competing with, with Kmart. You know, They didn't mm -hmm. see them as competing with Sears which me and the industry, we knew we were. Um, and so then later, as the whole department store industry was going downhill and kind of collapsing, getting eaten alive, actually more by uh, Ross stores, TJ Maxx and Marshalls than by anybody, um, then the, uh, the government said, oh, well, it's okay, you can all merge. And, and like the uh, seven biggest companies all became one, became Macy's. And the government didn't stop it then because it, it was perhaps required for survival. There's still a couple that aren't part of Macy's, Nordstrom's and Dillard's among uh, larger ones, but um, th they're always looking backwards. They, they, they can't see the future. And when Bezos was being, you know, in congressional testimony recently, he said, look, we're half the size of Walmart. We're not the biggest. And, and the, the, the Congress person, well, no, that's not true. We don't want to hear that. You're, you're blurring the issue. No, man. Competition is always there. And it's always ready because of the profit motive to come out of the woodwork and chew up your rear end, you know, or at least yep. nibble around your ankles for a while. You know, and so I just and and all the the thing from both parties about, oh, let's break up big tech. Um, I just don't see the payoff. Um, uh, let the customers decide. Let the companies battle it out. Let them enter each other's fields as they increasingly do. Apple and Amazon are in the movie business now. Um, and you hear about, oh, big media. It's all just a handful of companies. It's just nonsense. The amount of media options available to the American people are unprecedented with the rise of the internet. The number of voices, a number of political views, a number of religious possi religion possibilities, you know, it's unbelievable. We, we used to yet. Yeah, everybody read Life Magazine and Time Magazine and your favorite local newspaper, one of two or three usually. Um, uh, everybody watched CBS, Walter Cronkite, NBC and ABC were behind them. Uh, but there were three choices, all of which looked pretty much the same, just like Time and Newsweek and U.S. News and World Report. All of them had the, usually the same cover story every week. 
uh, it was much more monolithic, you know, uh, much more where the whole country was all reading the same stuff and seeing the same stuff, much more than today, uh, yeah. which which got negatives as well as the positives. You know, there are people who make a case it was better then, uh, but um, but the change is the one thing you can't uh, can't stop. But yeah, well, Gary, I appreciate okay. you uh, taking so much time to talk with me this afternoon.